Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode two of the MTU Succeeding Together series. We're very excited to be here tonight, and we're very much uh, looking forward to talking to you, answering some of your questions, and uh, seeing how it all pans out under a general theme of space and opportunity for all. Uh, so my name is Niall Smith. I'm head of research at MTU Cork and head of Blackrock Castle Observatory. And uh, to my top right is Danielle. Danielle. Hi, Niall. I'm Danielle. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining tonight. I am a telescope operator at MTU Blackrock Castle Observatory, and I work alongside Alan. Alan, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks very much, Danielle. I am the uh, centre manager and co-founder of Blackrock Castle Observatory and um, love interacting with uh, Big Bertha, which we have up at the top of the castle. Um, so it, it's, uh, we're, we're going to have a very nice discussion about what we have seen and what we're potentially going to see with the likes of uh, the telescope. <laughs> So thanks, Al. Uh, so if you uh, looked at the information that was circulated, you will have seen a competition. So of course, at some point, we're going to talk to you about the competition. And to help you with that, Danielle is going to take you on a, a bit of a virtual tour of some of the things to see in the night sky and give you some hints and tips on taking shots of the moon. So over the next month, you have an opportunity to take some pictures of the moon, including on April the 27th, when we have the first of 2021's supermoons. So we might want to have a discussion about that later on. There's different views about supermoons and whether they're really good or not so good. So we have a bit of a chat around that. Um, for the most part, we're going to do this as a fireside chat. So we're going to be uh, hopefully relying on some interesting questions to us in directions that currently we're not expecting to go with this conversation and that's brilliant so we look forward to that but just maybe for those of you who are less familiar with the Black Rock Castle two minutes of a summary of where it all came from and it's probably interesting to see that back in 2004 myself and Al were part of a small group of people uh, with an American entrepreneur who were looking for somewhere to build an observatory in Cork and we noticed that the city council had bought Black Rock Castle, which at that time in 2004 was rather derelict. Uh, and the idea was spawned uh, amongst uh, a small group of us to suggest to the city council that maybe they would be interested in putting our observatory into the castle. Now, I have to be honest, we thought they would say no, but they didn't, they said yes. And that was fantastic because uh, uh, within about six months of us starting, we had a plan for converting Black Rock Castle into an observatory, but also a place which celebrates the heritage and culture of Cork. And the overall idea is that Black Rock Castle as an observatory, it celebrates the history and culture of Cork, but also looks towards the future. Uh, so uh, we've been open since 2007. Uh, we have at this point roughly 100,000, a little over, visitors per year. Obviously not last year, we won't break any records this year, I'm afraid. Uh, and that's a lot of people who come through the gates. We deal with a lot of school groups, about uh, 30,000 school, uh, 30, school kids throughout the course of the year. And depending on the way you count the total outreach, uh, because we do a lot of television and radio type things, then there's a lot of other people who get... Uh, that we get to help to hopefully inspire and enthuse. So there's a, uh, the idea behind Black Rock is that we take space as a catalyst for the conversation. So we really try to understand how does space help us to inspire? How does space help us to uh, enthuse? And uh, how can space do even more than that? And that's going to come up, I hope, during our conversations uh, this evening. And by more than that, we're going to talk a little bit about Space 4.0 which really is the next iteration of space uh, and the space where we can all potentially start to do things that we couldn't have done even 10 years ago. Now, rather than go jump forward, I'm not going to talk about space 4.0 for, for a few minutes, but that's going to come a little bit later in, in this presentation. So the observatory itself, it's exciting for us. It's uh, really uh, great that now as MTU, we have a place 
to interact with so many people, to talk about the wonders of space, but use that as a catalyst to really understand how we have to protect our own home planet and to consider things which are important to us all, dear to us all, including things like climate change. And um, so uh, without continuing with more discussion about BlackRock for the minute, uh, I think I'll hand over to Danielle and ask her to talk a little bit about what's in the sky, how you might see it, and also just for everyone to be aware that Danielle is really going to be mostly the master of ceremonies tonight. So uh, you want to see Danielle tell us what we should be talking about and keeping an eye as well in the chat uh, as to how we deal with questions. Danielle, over to you. All right, thank you so much, Niall. Uh, like Niall had mentioned, we are going to have uh, a Q&A session at the very end. So as we're going through, when you have questions that pop into your mind about anything that we're discussing tonight, do feel free if you're joining us, there's a Q&A um, button at the bottom and you can actually type in there any of your questions. We'll be addressing those uh, as it goes to, at the end of uh, our discussion tonight. So uh, like Niall mentioned, I am going to run us through the night sky and I'm actually going to take a look, have everyone take a look at what we can expect to see with the naked eye. So this means you don't need to have a telescope. You don't need to have a set of binoculars or anything. As long as you're able to have a clear night, that's the trick. You know, we have a lot of clouds and things here in Cork, but we are going to be looking at um, the sky from the perspective of uh, from the perspective of Cork City. So if we go ahead and start this here. So I'm sharing my screen quickly. So I'm going to be using a software that uh, is very similar to the software that we use in the castle. We actually do planetarium shows. So if you visit us before pre-COVID, you would have been able to come in and visit BCO and be able to see uh, some of our live planetarium shows that we do. And I'm using a software called Stellarium. Stellarium's free, it's open source, which means that you can actually use it yourself and download it on your own computers at home. And it gives you, you can set your location. So you can actually go around the world and look at different, uh, different skies from different locations. But I'm set to cork. So if you can see actually at the uh, bottom of the screen here, you can see that it says cork there. So everything we're gonna look at from the night sky is going to be from where we are right now. And this is our date and time. But the beauty of having software like this is that you can zoom through the night sky at different times and you can, it helps you really plan out your, your night. So if you wanna see what's gonna be in the sky at a certain time, at a certain time, certain date, then you can actually go through and, and do that. So we're gonna just run through the sky tonight a bit. And you see it's seven o'clock, just after seven o'clock here, but I'm gonna speed the time up and we're gonna let it go dark. We're facing south. You can see there, you can probably see there's an S at the very, very bottom of the screen. So we're facing south at the moment. Now, just as I'm actually gonna to move towards the west here. So we're just after sunset. And actually let's go back a little bit because it's about 9.30 or so. So just, you don't wanna even, I'm gonna show you some stuff. You don't even have to be out very late to see. So if you go out in the night sky, even 8.30 or ish around that time, just as the sun is setting down and we get some, uh, some stars starting to appear in the sky. This is kind of what your sky is gonna look like um, in Cork City because we have a little bit of light pollution that we deal with. Being a city, we can't see all of the stars um, that are visible in the night sky. But we, for, for the city, I think it's pretty impressive what we can see. And I love going out into the night sky and taking a look. So the first thing we're gonna look at that you don't need to see, don't need to use a telescope to see is actually a planet. So you might see that it's labeled here. We have the red planet Mars in the night sky with us at the moment. So if you go out, it'll be one of the first objects visible, visible in the night sky after the sun starts to set because it's gonna be brighter than a lot of the other stars around in the sky. So that'll give you an idea that you're probably looking at Mars is because it's decently bright Another thing to look for is that you'll notice the stars twinkle in the sky, but planets tend to be a little more stable. The light that you're seeing is kind of not so twinkly the way the, the, the stars are. So if you're looking just after sunset right now and it's not super twinkly, then it's probably Mars. The other thing to look for is that it's got a reddish tint. So you'll notice even the other stars in, uh, in Stellarium, some of them are bluish and that kind of thing, but Mars has this orangey kind of 
uh, red tint to it. So those three things you want to look for when you're looking up into the night sky. And like I mentioned, just after sunset, and we're looking towards west, southwest kind of uh, part of the night sky. So Mars is really interesting. I'm sure we're going to get a lot more into conversation later about Mars. It is a hot topic for space travel and astronomy and everything right now. And I'm sure a lot of people have seen things with Elon Musk and everything. So we'll talk a lot more about that later. But actually, so this is what it'll look like with the naked eye. Um, and in Stellarium, the beauty of Stellarium is that you can actually zoom in. So we're going to just take, like, quickly take a look and zoom in here. Now the fun part, oh, wait, hold on. I actually <laughs> just sped up my time there. There we go. There we go. So Mars is, because it's actually red, that's why we're able to see that red color with our eye, that the planet itself is actually red. So when the ancient Romans were going out into the night sky, they would have seen Mars the way you see it when you walk out into the night sky. They would not have had telescopes. So they saw this red dot in the sky. They decided to name it Mars after their god of war because it was the color of blood. So maybe not the nicest name in the world, but that's how it got its name. But much later, once we started having telescopes and we can start exploring uh, deeper into space and seeing more detail, there were two moons that were discovered around Mars. And you can see there's Deimos and Phobos there. And so when they discovered the moons of Mars, then this is not the ancient Romans. Now we're talking like a, a century ago, not, not that long ago. And um, when they discovered the moons, they decided to stick with the war theme that were ha was happening. And they got Deimos and Phobos, which means fear and terror. So maybe not the nicest names, but it was nice that they kept that theme going along there. So Mars has two very small little moons. They're not as impressive as our, our big, uh, beautiful moon that we have here on Earth. But um, for a small planet, it's kind of cool that it does have two moons in the night sky. So if you do have a good pair of binoculars, you might be able to see Mars a little bit brighter, but you wouldn't see it like this. Even through uh, my own telescope here, it's kind of difficult to see Mars with, with this kind of detail. But that's the beauty of having software like this is that you get to be able to zoom in and really take a look. And the moons change position and things around the, uh, the other planets, just the way our moon goes around our planet. So every night, it could look a little bit different in the, the night sky. So it's always kind of fun to play around with the software and see what the positions look like and, and what the planets look like and, and that sort of thing. So that's your first object in the night sky here. So we're just gonna zoom out and start moving a little bit to the south, southwest-ish here. So if we take a look, we can see, I'm just gonna bring up uh, some of the artwork. So we have lots of constellations that we have in the night sky. And when we are looking at these constellations, we have a lot, we have 88 altogether. So the whole sky is basically mapped in constellations. And they were very useful in the past. They worked as a calendar. They, they worked as a, a lot of different um, navigation type of things. So now they're just um, kind of nice to know, but we as astronomers, uh, we don't really use the constellations in any sort of scientific way. But if you are going out and looking in the night sky, it is easy to kind of pick out um, different constellations. And you kind of, for me, it's helpful to know which direction I'm looking in. So if I look at this constellation here, this is Orion, this is the Orion constellation. And then I know that I'm looking more towards the Southern part of the sky. And if you've ever seen Orion, it's very bright. You have two bright stars at the top. Two, those are the shoulders. And then two stars at the bottom, which is his knee and his foot. And in the middle, probably what most people would know would be the Orion belt, Orion's belt, those three stars in the middle there. These stars are very bright and it's a very big constellation. So it's pretty easy to pick out in the night sky. Now, if you are able to pick out Orion's uh, belt, if we just zoom in here a little bit, right below the belt, we have the Orion Nebula which is beautiful in the night sky. And you can actually see the Orion Nebula with your eye. It's not gonna look like this. It's not gonna have that kind of detail and the purples and that sort of thing in it. Uh, but you can, you can actually look at it. If, when you're looking at the Orion constellation just below the belts there, it, you'll see this kind of fuzzy patch just below Orion's belt. And a little tip 
that I can give you is if you're going out and you're looking at the Orion Nebula with your eye, don't look directly at the nebula. Kind of look a little bit off to the left or a little bit off to the right. You kind of use a bit of the side of your eye and then you can start to make out that there is there's a cloudy, misty patch there. It's not just stars in that area. So it's really beautiful. It's really, uh, I love the fact that we can actually see a nebula just with our eye with no, no telescopes or anything like that. And it's just a beautiful part of the night sky. So that's your second object. We have a planet, now a nebula. And we're gonna zoom out one more time and just move across the sky here. We'll take away our artwork and if we just speed up a little bit, we're gonna move across the Southern sky and we're gonna look towards the East. So like Niall had mentioned earlier, we have a moon competition coming up. So if you're able to get out into the night sky and you have to go a little bit, oh, sorry, go a little bit later, in the night sky because um, we are right around full moon. So that means that the moon is rising opposite to the sun. So as the sun is setting, the moon is coming up. So our moon is going to be coming up a little bit later each night. But if you start to go out, you see this is just before 10 o'clock, we'll have uh, the moon starting to rise above the horizon there. So it'll be a beautiful time to look at the moon. It's very, very bright. And like I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about a super moon later. So in the next month, as um, you're going out in the sky and hopefully get, we, we get some clear nights, if you are able to snap a picture of the moon and you can take that picture and submit it for our uh, competition, our moon photo competition, with a prize of a telescope. And a lot of all of the details and everything for the competition are on the website. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the moon is also a very hot topic right now. So Mars, I mentioned, is very big for space exploration, but the moon is also a very big target for space exploration right now. Probably, maybe in my opinion, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit later in discussion, maybe more exciting than the Mars mission. We can talk about that a little bit later, but there's a lot of stuff planned for the moon, including traveling back there, not just getting um, satellites and things and, and uh, sending missions out to the moon, but sending people back to the moon and having people land on the moon again, which is so, so exciting to me. So the moon's been gorgeous lately. And let's just zoom in here. There she is. So I get asked all the time, what's your favorite object to look at in the night sky? And the way I'm talking about the moon right now, it might come as no surprise that the moon is my favorite object in the night sky. I never get sick of it. Nebulas are beautiful and there are so many beautiful wonders, but I love that the moon is there. I love that I can see it no matter what sort of light pollution I'm in. It's just fantastic. And you, like I mentioned, you don't need to have any sort of equipment to be able to take a look at the moon. One of the fun little things about the moon that I really enjoy as well is that if you look at the side of the moon, I'm not sure if you can see the arrow here, uh, but we have the man on the moon. And the man on the moon, you have his legs and his head there. And one of, one of the first things I ever learned when I came to Cork from a, a friend of mine was that he calls this a rugby player and that he calls this the man in the moon, and then that's the rugby ball next to the man. So I just think that's kind of interesting. And it's such a cork thing. I don't think anybody else would call that out, <laughs> but I love it. So those are your three objects to take a look at in the night sky. You have three different types of things to look at. You have a planet, you have a nebula, and you have the moon, and all of those things you can have a look at without any sort of equipment. So good luck with the competition. I hope you get some good snaps of the moon, and it's it could be taken with anything. It doesn't matter what kind of equipment you have, if it's your phone, if you've got a camera, whatever you got, get out, take a look at the moon, snap a picture and then send it to us. We'd love to see it. So I'm gonna end my presentation here and send this back to Niall. Yes, thank Danielle. So we would encourage everybody to get out and have a look at the moon and Mars and all the rest. I mean, one of the things that I think is often underestimated is just how by going out and let your eyes adapt to the dark and looking up at the sky how wonderful that can be and I've heard it often said about this overview effect that uh, astronauts when they look back on earth 
they get a real impression of scale in the universe when they're looking back on Earth. But I have to say, I think if you go out and it's quite a dark site, so maybe when you're on holidays, if you live in a city and you look up at the sky from a dark side, I, I challenge anyone not to feel the, the underview effect, as I sometimes call it. I think it, you, you feel very small in a very large universe. You, as you said, you don't need a telescope. You just need to give your eyes 20 minutes to adapt to the dark and you will see so much going on in the sky but just the sense of scale, even if it isn't possible to measure that, you just kind of get that sense that you're very small and the universe is very big. I love that. I've never, never stopped feeling that. So encourage people to go out and have a look. And as Daniela said, sometimes you don't need, you don't need equipment. Now we could probably talk all night long about going out and looking at the sky, but we decided that we'd talk about a few different bits and pieces. So Danielle, you were going to start the next bit and keep an eye obviously on any questions and so on as well for us to discuss. So what is it that we're going to go to next? Yeah, so since we ended on the moon, I'd like to start off with the moon and because it is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So we are talking about traveling back. And when I say we, I mean the human race. So the European Space Agency is talking about this, NASA is talking about this, uh, private companies are talking about this. And there's a lot of discussion about going back, but then staying, like being there, building lunar villages. So in terms of um, traveling, what does it take for us to actually get there? Does this seem, because the goal is 2024, right? Do we think this is a realistic goal to get there from, now, from between now and then that we'll be able to get there and then live on the moon? Yeah, well, maybe I, I, just a couple of thoughts to me and then Al, you jump in and Danielle, you jump in. And if anybody has an observation that they want to make, please jump in. Um, so I think, first of all, going to the moon uh, is one thing. It's relatively close. We've been there before. We know we can get there. But there's a number of things that people are trying to do now, which is different. Um, first of all, go there using less energy. So basically more efficient rockets. Secondly, go there and stay longer. So we've only ever been on the surface of the moon for you know, periods of less than 24 hours at, at a time. Now it's about going there and staying there long term. And long term could be months uh, for individuals and then resupply on a continuous basis. That's a massively different challenge when you do that um, if, you go to, if you go to the moon using that, that approach. So the, one of the questions is, um, why you do that. But actually, before saying that, one thing you mentioned, Mars, Danielle. So Mars is, is quite far away and the moon is quite close, but the moon is a horrendous environment to be in. So if you're on the surface of the moon and you're basically at over boiling point during the, the lunar, middle of the lunar day, which actually goes on for 14 Earth days. And then when you go into lunar night, you're almost at absolute zero. So you're at minus 200 and odd degree centigrade. So it, it's it's massively challenging. Uh, we need to figure out all sorts of ways we can protect yeah. humans um, and, and it, do that in a way. It's interesting that the... To, to survive. I mean, the, the, the difference between um, what people would, would typically uh, chat about between the, the dark side of the moon and the far side of the moon, because, uh, you know, there are two differences between them because the moon does actually go through a full cycle of being illuminated, uh, so uh, like by the sun. So, um, you know, the dark side of the moon is just what we, we would normally uh, associate with it, because it obviously it faces us in one direction, um, although it it, wob it does ha have a, a slight uh, wobble uh, associated with it, but. Um, but in, oh, oh, in in the greater scheme of things, if one was to actually, you know, from from a human point of view, if one was to actually go to the moon, you have to account for what exactly you were saying: the discrepancy and the difference between significant difference. The uh, obviously the, the the pressure, because obviously the moon doesn't have any atmosphere, but um, but the, the difference between the temperatures, um, which would be absolutely 
significant and would put any instrumentation and whatnot. So it's significant pressure um, and instrumentation differences between, uh, let's say, the moon, even compared to Mars. Mars is actually probably easier from an atmospherical point of view um, because it, it doesn't have that, 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 that difference between the temperatures. So... Uh, so this is the question. This is it. So is it easier to build a village on a lunar village and expect that that would be the easiest way to have humans live off of the planet? Or is it easier to live for humans to live on Mars? Well, interesting. If you look at, um, if you look at what uh, Elon Musk says, um, he wants to go straight to Mars. He doesn't want yeah. to go by the moon. He just wants to go straight to Mars. And Mars uh, has, has lots of water. It's frozen, but there's lots of it there. It has uh, a type of uh, regolith or soil that, that we know that we, we, can, we can use. We probably have tested Mars more thoroughly for evidence of organic materials and, and, and uh, soil that can support, um, uh, uh, easily support um, uh, plants than we, than we have on, on the surface of the moon. The, the issue though, is that it takes you six months to get there and um, it is horrendously expensive to get there and there's all sorts of moral issues around if you do get there what's the risk of coming back or not and it, so it's a when you look at something like NASA uh, or the European Space Agency they really and I think appropriately have taken the view that if we're going to do human exploration that we really have to place as a priority the successful return of those humans. Um, and and I, I, while I'm not suggesting that SpaceX or something doesn't want to return people, I think it's it's that's where the, the, the baby step comes from. I, I must say, by the way, Daniel, that there are a couple of people, a couple of researchers in MTU who are working with companies who are developing technologies for use on the moon. So what one is related to, to satellite navigation um, because at the moment we don't have any, there's no GPS, there's no sat nav on the moon. Yeah. So how do you know where to land? How do you know where you are? We take it for granted now uh, on the surface of the earth. It's a whole big challenge on the surface of the moon. So another company that were, that some researchers from NTU are working with, which is really related to the whole use of, um, of uh, low ultra low power devices um, because when you're in the dark on the dark side of the moon as Al pointed out which I think is a Pink Floyd uh, album actually but well, I said the far side the, as opposed the to far the side the, exactly the, yeah so um, the, the, uh, the the question is how, how do you survive in, in those conditions and, and what sorts of low power devices can you use so we're even seeing that MTU researchers research from lots of different institutions are now becoming involved and, 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 and that's only likely to grow, grow as more opportunities open up for the research community be, to become involved. You're seeing more calls now being opened by the funding agencies, the likes of the European Space Agency, but now also the European Commission. So it's a very exciting time it, it, to, to, to be a, a technologist who wants to go to the moon or to be somebody who's involved on the the, the clinical side of things. One other thing, just, just to finish um, uh, with my comment on this point, um, that's come up just very recently um, that we started to look at a, a third company, which is related to medical devices and how they operate in, in low gravity. So, you know, things operate one way and we've built medical devices to assume 1G. But what if you're on the International Space Station? You know, it, it doesn't work like that. If you're on the moon, the gravity is one sixth here. So if you have to operate on somebody, what does that do? How do your medical devices that might have, you know, have worked under 1G, more importantly, how does your physiology that might work under 1G work under one sixth gravity? And so what do we have to do? So we're looking into the possibility of, uh, of medical devices. That, that work under smaller gravity. So uh, any area of interest, it's gonna, we're gonna need it to go back to the moon permanently, but we're also gonna need artists. We're going to need, you know, people across all domains because if we're gonna be permanently there. Lockdown has showed us how, how it challenges us to be isolated and separated from our loved ones. So, you know, if you're going to the moon for six months, nine months or whatever, and you want normal people to go, 
then we need to give them normal things to do in time that's going to be necessary and that's well, absolutely and, yeah. and I, I, I think ultimately Niall you know the reality is we're going to have something in, in like in you know obviously we've Starlink at the moment um, but we're going to have something um, and I'm um, patent pending moon link um, we're going to have some um, some satellites going around uh, the moon, which are going to be your what you were talking about the the GPS equivalent of the moon. Um, we're going to have to have that, um, and the same on Mars and whatnot. And but but that is a stepping stone for us to move out further as well. So you know, we we can. We're going to have to move out further. We 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 do know this, um, uh, based on the life cycle of our own sun. Uh, at the minute, we we know what that at some point we're we have a bit of time, um, but we are going to have to move out uh, further. So um, we we need to we need to kind of start. So it's uh, a good point, Alan. It is because I I talk about this a lot, and I say to people because I hear this, you know exactly what Niall said Elon just wants to skip right to Mars and I think it's a very good stepping point to go uh, to go to the moon first Part of exactly what Niall said too is that it's much closer so it's not as far you know it takes three days to get out to the moon versus months and like six months I think is even kind of um, um, that's a it takes longer depending <laughs> it's a range to get to Mars you know so and me I think like now I was saying that um, even having different types of people and getting along I think it's very interesting the anthropological side of space travel because um, and the psychological side of space travel because it's one thing to be stuck in a rocket like the Apollo guys were out stuck with each other for a week right and only three of them but if you're going to Mars you're probably going to take a few more people with you and you're still going to be stuck in a tiny space so when I talk to kids I'm like you know when you're in class and you have to like learn how to get along and do group projects and things, that's going to be really important for space pro uh, travel because you're going to have to be really good at getting along with people for a very long time in a very- in Years, you're talking years. Yeah, and yeah, because that's just 10 months, six to 10 months to get out to the planet. That's not even just being on there. And then you have to be there for a while before you can return again. So it's a completely different thing. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting because um, we have a comment in the chat here saying, if SpaceX, and from Gabrielle, thanks for the chat, for the comment, um, if SpaceX succeeds in building of the Starship, maybe it could be an achievable date to get out there um, to the moon, not too, not too far off in the distant future. So I think with the, with the mention of SpaceX here, I think that's a good transition to go right into uh, Space 4.0, because like, like not, uh, Alan mentioned, we do have things like Starlink uh, happening and Maybe people don't really know what Starlink is. I know people hear it, it's in the news a lot, uh, but can we, would, would either one of you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, just just before, Danielle, I noticed there's two questions have come in as well, which okay. might be nice to deal with. Um, uh, they're tough ones. Uh, so I, 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 was going to, I was going to avoid them, but uh, you know, let's, <laughs> let's, let's do what the scientists do and we'll, we'll give it a go. So I think, it's, I just know from, from Daniel O'Reilly, how can we deal with the extreme radiation that astronauts will be faced with journeying, journeying to the moon and to Mars? And that's a really good question and it's a real big problem because um, what protects us on the Earth, primarily there's two things, the atmosphere, but mostly it's our magnetic field. Neither the moon nor the space between the planets nor Mars have a magnetic field. So there's really no protection from both the solar radiation and radiation from things like supernovae or colliding neutron stars or colliding um, clouds, which can accelerate uh, particles up to very high energies uh, and, and they're really dangerous uh, to us all. And at the moment, it's a big problem. So uh, it, it is a limiting factor if we put it this way, on your life expectancy in space. So there's two ways to try to, to sort this. One is to protect, and there are, there are various different ways that are being considered to provide protection. The problem with protection traditionally, if you do it in, let's say, a nuclear reactor on the earth, you just big build, you build big walls. You make things very thick and very heavy. That's not gonna work in space 
maybe when you go to the moon, you can build things with really thick walls, but ultimately it, it's not a solution because it's too expensive for one thing. And the second way that you can try to do it is you can try to look at what, how does radiation damage us? And can we actually go in and undo the damage? So there's kind of this genetic approach and then there's this physical approach and there's a little bit of in between, but it's a really hot topic at the moment. Uh, bone loss, by the way, is another thing which is related to this. You, you start to lose your bones once you go into, into zero G and even at six G you are lose yeah. some bone mass and that's a real, that's a real problem. So, so it's a great question. And by the way, Daniel, there's no direct answer at, at the moment. So it's something we need to do a lot more research on to figure out good ways to do it but at the minute. It's a big problem. It really is a big problem. And there is a, a follow on, I think, from that. I don't know if Al or Danielle, but from Vicky. Um, uh, so Vicky, so I'll read it out. And if one of you wants to take it, it's noting your comment on moral concerns around to Mars. Do you believe that Mars One mission will be permitted to go ahead? So um, that's an interesting one. And I'm going to hand the moral question from Vicky back to you. <laughs> um, as far as I know, the Mars One mission is not on track anymore, right? Isn't that? Is I, I think the Mars One mission itself, yeah, isn't. I think they couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess the principle is still the same. Yeah, but I think that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, I, I'd actually, it's funny because I just talked about this uh, early last week uh, about the Mars One mission, because at the time that this was really big, I thought I could do this. I've been traveling around a lot. I know what it's like to live away from family, to be separated, disconnected, not being able to communicate. That's the same as it's going to be on Mars. I'm built for this. And I watched some of the, the interviews that they had for the people that were selected. And I'm like, these are my people. Like, let's go. I'm really glad that didn't go ahead because I don't know what I was, now that I'm like, <laughs> thinking about it more, I'm like, I don't know if I would be okay with sitting on top of a rocket. <laughs> I don't know if I'm okay with that, but I like to add to the point that you mentioned earlier about the, the pandemic and uh, being in lockdown and things. My, my follow on to that was that I think that this situation that we're in will probably produce good astronauts because we've had to be very good at being isolated and kind of being on our own and trying to figure our way through that. And that's going to be a good quality going forward in terms of like being on another planet away from your own planet where you're not able to see what you're used to and have a life that you're the normal life that you're used to. So I think it'll be interesting to see what actually comes out of, uh, of this whole lockdown situation. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think uh, the un, unfortunate um, um, repercussions of what the lockdown has has given an opportunity to but uh, but it's also um it's also something that astronauts um train for significantly which is the isolation uh of of, of the scenario that they're in so like so so some astronauts if they're on the international space station they could be up there for six nine months at a time uh so they're used to isolation so you know they would be reasonably, I would have thought, comfortable and trained in how to handle uh, certain scenarios. Uh, if 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 it does, if something goes wrong and they need to stay there for an extended period of time, um, as long as we can, going back to what Niall was talking about uh, in in terms of the distance between here and Mars, for example, as long as we can continue to give them the supplies that they need um, to, to, to survive, then I, 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 I think it is possible. And I, I, it could be, in my opinion, probably closer to 2050 by the time it happens um, in terms of going to Mars, for example. But, um, but I, I do think it is on the cards and I do think it will happen. I think one of the, the, the moral parts of the question with uh, Mars One, though, as well, guys, was that you weren't coming back. And that was one of the issues. So it was a one way trip. There was no technology to bring you back. So it wasn't even that um, we'll see what happens. It's highly dangerous. It was literally we go, we deposit you there. You live out your life on Mars. You're not coming back. Personally, I think it's a really bad idea. I know it was likened to Christopher Columbus going and, and, and exploring, but Christopher Columbus did, was not on a one-way mission. Christopher Columbus was going to try to make a lot of money, actually, by finding gold and other things and bringing them back. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use the same analogy that has been used elsewhere. 
we talked to some people who were on, who were, had been selected for the Mars one down to the last 20 or 30. And uh, I was always very uncomfortable. I have to be honest, just saying it to Vicky, very uncomfortable with it. With, with, with it. I, I like the idea that if we're going to send people out and this is where we're going to the moon, I think it's important that we can bring them back if they need to come back and if they want to come back. Yeah, it, I totally agree with that. Yeah, so so it, it's it's really yeah it's it's an interesting one and um there's a there's a a, a sort of a, a nasty sense of of, of commercializing and people on on some of these things and um this wouldn't be good anyway just so that was two questions um Danielle that were in yeah. which I don't know whether we've well I don't know if there's an answer to them but they're part of a discussion and, and uh, yeah no ab ab thanks, absolutely and, and I, I I I totally agree I I. I would be of a similar opinion in, in that bringing people back from or giving them the at least the opportunity to come back uh, from from where they're uh, going is, is should should always be an option yeah. um, because it, it's very important to because we like we all have you know families at home we all have you know as a human species uh, we all like to be around or kin, uh, so to speak. Uh, so I, I definitely agree that giving it at least a, an opportunity because if you can technologically, if you can go there, you can come back. It's just a matter of figuring out the logistics about the technology and, and whatnot around it. So you just need to figure out the technology uh, and we have the capacity to do that. So. Um, yeah, and I think um, it's, that's it's a very important point. I think it's the, it's the technology to be able to and like they had mentioned earlier about the uh, SpaceX and having uh, the Starship be able to take off and land is really interesting to watch. It's very much uh, history in the making and it makes this sort of space travel feel very real and feel like this is a possibility and we probably will be able to go and then also come back. Yeah. So and um, Danielle, yeah. maybe just to point out that we also just um from the, an MTU perspective, uh, we have one of our um, PhD students who's also actually uh, um, connected very strongly with ourselves at, uh, at the observatory, so Kean uh, O'Regan, who is, is working on his PhD on looking at effectively human exploration and how we can augment that and support that through, through uh, um, virtual reality and augmented reality, but in a way which allows people to deal with stressful situations and so forth. So there's a really, again, it's back to that whole issue of how do you deal with the person in human exploration side of things. Again, I see we've got a couple of questions in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the question box, Danielle, don't you want to deal yeah. with it? First of yeah. all, there's a really good one from Texas. So I yeah, I saw that, and I and I love the this question because uh, thank you for visiting all the way from Texas. First of all, um, but also this is my favorite kind of question. We talk more about the technology and talk about the cameras and the telescopes. Um, and uh, so I'll just read it. Yes, I visited BCO a few years ago, and I really enjoyed the experience. Can you provide some technical details about the observatory's telescope and camera? and also the science work that it, uh, is undertaken there. Thanks. Um, uh, do we have enough time? Like I can take- um, Okay. So <laughs> gotta be quick guys, gotta be quick. Gotta be quick. So, um, okay, will so, I go? Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we use, um, a, a, Niall, if you don't mind, um, we can, so we use at the observatory itself, we use a 16 inch, uh, LX200R uh, Mead telescope system um, and we have a QSI uh, camera system on the back. Do you want uh, me to go ahead and share that picture, Al? I can show uh, what's what the... Do you have, the, do you have yeah. a, a, an example, Daniel? I can show exactly what you're talking about here. Yeah, um, so we, we use a number of camera systems depending on whether we're going to a local whether we're our local or whether we're going to a, a larger telescope system um so we have um L, uh, we have what's called uh low light imaging systems uh for the larger telescopes but for for local we use any uh, what's called the the qsi 5a3 um, which, ha uh, as I say, has an integrated filter wheel and all that kind of, uh, so we, we plug that on. So it's an 
LX200, 16 inch, with the QSI 5A3. So that, that's what we pri primarily use uh, at Black Rock Castle Observatory. Um, we then test other systems on the back end of that system, and then we take them to larger telescope systems. Uh, and and that, that's where we, we take images of our blazers and extrasolar planets, um, where we uh, take light curves um, and analyze light curves associated with um, whether or not the black hole is um, whether it's getting brighter or dimmer and uh, when it comes to extrasolar planets, whether we can see when, when the extrasolar planet uh, is, is uh, dipping. So, um, so we, we have a number of different systems that we use, um, but I'd be happy to talk with you um, offline. So if you want to, obviously, as, as, as Danielle has said, if you want to drop us an email at like info at bco.e or something like that, then I'd be happy to, to chat with you about um, the, you know, the physical setup that we have here. Um, there's a and there's another question from Gabrielle, I believe. Um, yes. um, yeah. yeah. Do you think the future of space exploration will be performed only by private companies? And what do you think about the idea of asteroid mining? Interesting, Alan, because we actually just talked about this recently. Yeah. Well, maybe just a couple of quick comments uh, from me because I'm very interested in this. So of course it's that enthusiasm. So um, it's uh, you know back down on the enthusiasm a little bit, but nevertheless. Um, so I, I think private companies are going to become an integral part of um, elements of space exploration. But I think we'll, for the foreseeable future, um, uh, you'll see the likes of large intergovernmental organizations or governmental organizations like NASA, space agency and their equivalents uh, will will pick up the bits of the space exploration which are non-commercial. So if we really want to understand the universe, one of the things that we know is we can't commercialize everything. For example, MTU, we can't be a fully commercial operation. We can't, our, our role is to make sure that we're educating the next generation of, of an individual for the world ahead. All of those go out into society and do good things. That's great. But, but you can't expect that. So we, we need to do that through some form of taxation. I know that sounds terribly trite or whatever, but that's essentially a model that we've had and a model that we're going to need to continue to use. Why? Because that gives us independence. So we need an independence about deciding will we go to the moon, will we go to Mars as well? However, what we're seeing, of course, is that some companies are becoming so large, like SpaceX, that they can, in principle, start to talk about coming together with other private companies and doing almost everything themselves. And that's okay if you have a lot of money in your bank account and that's what you want to do. But sustainably, I think we'll, we'll find that large organizations, governments and so on will always continue to be involved. In terms of the asteroid mining, uh, so asteroids are rocky objects uh, which contain massive amounts of very interesting um, uh, chemicals and elements that we need here on Earth or that we use at the moment for some of our electronics, uh, for example, but also for other, um, other um, projects. The issue is, although we have them in abundance on the Earth, it's hard to get at them, it's hard to find them. But when you go to an asteroid, the asteroids are largely made up of them, so it's, it's cheaper to take them from the asteroid. So we're seeing at the moment that Luxembourg, for example, as a country, has decided that it is going to be the centre for supporting asteroid mining. They have a series of initiatives. If you're an entrepreneur, you want to get involved in asteroid mining, go to Luxembourg. And what they're doing is they're assisting you to develop regulations and primarily regulations, but also technologies that will allow us to mine asteroids into the future. So that's a very exciting area. And, and for those of you who don't know, we've already brought back samples from asteroids. So going forward, it will become, and I know this sounds sort of incredible, it will be less expensive to mine from an asteroid than it will be to mine from the planet Earth. And once that commercial tipping point is reached, we're going to asteroids. So there's some people at the moment building rockets 
building samplers and all the rest to extract from asteroids. It will happen. I, I, I expect to see it in my lifetime. Um, actually, I, I just realized I don't want my, I expect my lifetime to be. I expect to see it, I hope, in the next 10 or 15 <laughs> So I think I think in terms of the answer, because we have another number of other questions. So maybe we want to yeah. get some questions. Yeah. Well, um, you know what I mean? Uh, maybe that might be good, guys. So at least we can. So Alice has a great one if one of you wants to take that, because it's great to see questions and I don't want to let anybody uh, off. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. I was I was going to uh, just just finish out your commentary now um, by saying, especially when you consider um, the likes of uh, what SpaceX and other companies have achieved. Um, in terms of self-landing um, on the likes of uh, uh, a moving object. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree that, you know, landing on a comet and mining it is, is actually not too far in the distant future. I, I completely agree. Um, so, yeah, so we do have a question in from Alice. So, um, uh, Danielle, do you... Um, do you I was want to say, talk about yeah. uh, space based and um, and it becoming an issue and what are we are going to have environmental impact? Um, I yeah. So Alice's question is, um, can you talk about the amount of foreign objects and space waste that is becoming an issue now? We are trying to cope with environmental environmental issues on Earth. Will we now compromise space? And I think this is so important. I hear this a lot. And um, we, there is a lot of space junk up there. And actually, this is a really topical question because a lot of, I feel a lot of people have seen the video recently of the, um, the burning up across the sky. I mean, it was massive. I think it was a SpaceX entry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's got a lot of people talking about what's actually up there. And um, this is something that we're really going to have to be very mindful of because when we have waste or space junk floating around and there's a lot of stuff from um, old missions and satellites that have gone down and they're just orbiting around earth and all of that kind of needs to be tracked as well because we're going to be launching and we are launching people and rockets up and we have to be very careful that we're not um, bumping into this space junk and that's not smashing into us but there's there are a lot of initiatives and i'm sure niall can go further into detail about this about um, cleaning up space and using technology do you, do you want to elaborate a little bit about that, Niall? Well, very briefly, just because of time, but but it, it's it's a really big area. And it's, um, so yes, yeah, so we're we're again we're starting to see some commercial companies getting involved in this. So uh, the likelihood is going forward, if you don't have a way where you can prove that your your rockets and your satellites, because remember the rocket brings the satellite up and the satellite, that they can't be returned. To Earth, and that could be burnt up in the atmosphere, for example, uh, but returned safely, so deorbited that you won't be allowed to launch. That's not the case at the moment. So, but it could be for the, fo the, the following, for example, suppose you know that you can um, get, you know, a lot of us are talking about returning or turning to things like organic food and food that's uh, uh, responsibly sourced and so on. One can imagine, because you're starting to see it, companies who are starting to put their hand up and say, you know what, we use responsibly sourced this and that to get our product up to space. We're going to make sure it deorbits. We're going to make sure that space doesn't become cluttered. So what's going to happen going forward, the likelihood is, well, likelihood may be too strong, but the idea behind it, in a way, is that going forward, you and me will only use products where companies are responsible. And it'll be market pressure that actually as companies do that. That market pressure doesn't exist at the minute. It, it hasn't needed to up to now. But as that market pressure comes in, you and me will decide, no, I'm not, I'm not using that dirty satellite stuff. I'm, I'm going to use a, a cleaner one. Now, it won't be complete. It won't be perfect. But you're starting to see discussions. And I think that's interesting because you mentioned about protecting the environment on the earth. We're all getting more concerned about that. And very quickly, we're actually getting concerned about the environment in space. That's a positive for me. That's a real positive that we're actually asking that question. Yeah, it, and, and space exploration is really, it's still kind of in, in its infancy. So it is really nice that we are looking at that now. And I think it is because we are becoming, like you mentioned, much more conscious of our, our own environment here on Earth. So Yakub has a uh, question here, what, which I think we could do a whole presentation on just this alone. What, will, what role will artificial intelligence play in space exploration? 
Who would like to take that question? <laughs> um, okay, so um, we can go until about uh, 10 o'clock this evening on this one. Um, Tomorrow evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So artificial intelligence absolutely will play a, a massive role in um, not just space exploration, but actually uh, uh, space technology overall. Uh, so it's a very good question. Um, so, th so there'll be elements of artificial intelligence that are going to be used and are currently in being investigated even within uh, MTU um, about uh, downward looking space technology. So space 4.0 what is what it's called, where we're, we're taking satellite images and trying to analyze what's going on on our own planet. Um, but equivocally, you can, uh, you, you could you could see how it, it would be applicable to the likes of uh, uh, Mars or the moon and so on. So uh, artificial intelligence is going to be an absolute, definitely a very important element of, of uh, space exploration overall. Um, so uh, uh, I would definitely recommend keeping an eye on that because not only is MTU involved in it, but it, a lot of other uh, entities uh, such as the European Space Agencies are very well uh, involved in it. So you know, definitely keep, keep an eye on that and stay involved in that because it is going to be a big player. Um, I'd just like just, to add on to that. Uh, sorry, Niall. Um, I had a conversation last week about artificial intelligence in space and what the role that it plays psychologically <coughs> to help with long distance space travel, they're looking at trying to use artificial intelligence as a, as a mediator between humans. Cause we're, we know we're not very logical. We're not, we know we're not very good at solving our own problems. And so maybe we can have a very logical artificial AI come in and basically go, well, your side of the argument is wrong this way and your side is this way. So this is how you'll be able to solve this and resolve this issue between you two humans. Mm -hmm. That was a really interesting way to use our AI for uh, space exploration. Um, did you have a point, Niall, or do you want to... Just, just very quickly, just to say there's, 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 uh, there's two PhD students in MTU who are working on artificial intelligence for space applications. One has started, one will start soon. So again, yeah, there's a lot going on that, uh, where we can use what we're good at. In this case, we have a lot of expertise in MTU on artificial intelligence, and then we look at different domains for it. It could, be, it could be cars, it could be the type of thing you're talking about there, social, in this case, space. And then there's a question from Margaret Linehan, we all know, Margaret, what about food logistics for a return trip to Mars? Four question marks. That's that's the essence of a difficult <laughs> question mark. So, so, uh, uh, so it's a great one. So, so clearly, um, this is one of the big the big challenges. You know, when we when we've gone to the moon or even to the International Space Station, we replant with the moon. We just brought enough. We went up there, brought enough with us, came back. It's like going out for the day with your sandwiches. You know, you can survive. Uh, the International Space Station gets replenished on a regular basis. Going to Mars, um, uh, we, we will simply, in the first iteration, the, 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 the plan is to have enough food with us to go there, spend some time there and come back. So in time, growing stuff like Matt Damon did or whatever in the Martian is what we're going to have to do. But we're simply going to have to pack it off. So it's probably going to be freeze dried. You can grow it. We know we can grow stuff in space, but the the this, the area you need is large. And from what I've seen so far, it's unlikely we'll be growing fresh food on the way. Now, if we can build big enough spacecraft, and that really that really relates to put enough money into it, then we we could grow it. But it's likely to be something that is nutritious, but maybe not a culinary delight. I know, Margaret, you're that's all your side of things there as well. So. So, um, so yeah, maybe, maybe if we go on to the next question, just because I see we're out of time and it's a couple of questions. I don't even know what happens exactly at seven o'clock, whether we all evaporate or... or yeah, or, but, uh, so Vicky O'Sullivan has a question. Is Space 4.0 intrinsically linked to Industry 4.0, which may have negative impact on environmental sustainability? Um, not actually... Not necessarily. Um, it's it's a very interesting question, Vicky, and it is definitely one that is worth investigating. Um, we would we would definitely be advocates that actually space four point zero would uh, would enhance the capacity to understand exactly what 
our impact on um, on our environment and our earth is uh, because it, it does give us the capacity to understand uh, earth in a lot more detail. Um, so for example, I saw an image recently of uh, using, um, using CubeSats actually. So CubeSats are actually quite small satellite systems in, in very low earth orbit. And I saw one recently and that which took an, an image of the, the ship that was uh, 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 lodged, uh, for want of a better word, but lodged at, um, in the Suez Canal. Um, and it was an incredible resolution and it was incredible detail. Um, but that's just one example. So uh, we, we can also use it to look at uh, a crop rotation and uh, help uh, help farmers and help rural communities, but also in uh, higher density higher density communities um, uh, to 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 get around and and to optimize their system. So I, I, I honestly believe that the space four point zero is is definitely a, a, a mechanism for moving forward. And I think it's it it well it's coming anyway. What are you know, Starlink is there, uh, Airbus are doing it, Boeing are doing it, Lockheed Martin are doing it. Yeah, so there's all these companies, they're doing it anyway. So um, it, it, it's a time to embrace it. So it, it can definitely um, it actually enhance what we, what we gain out of Earth rather than the other way around. So, um, but thank, thanks very much for the question. Yeah, it was very good. Um, the next one is a, a really good question as well. Uh, what skills, whether subjects at school or otherwise, have helped you most in your careers? And how would you convince someone to consider a career in the space industry? I could talk about this subject forever. <laughs> like This is just really good. Uh, the quick answer is whatever you're interested in and whatever you're good at could probably be applied to space. There is such a huge diversity in the space industry in terms of careers. And we mentioned a little bit about, um, it's not, I think a lot of people think it's astronauts, that's how you get into space, but it's not. There are so many different things. Engineers are fantastic. We need, and we need um, astronauts as well, but we also need doctors and we need people who understand the human body. We need to understand mentally how humans travel and how they're gonna deal with space. So psychologists are important. Uh, Niall mentioned earlier artists. Artists are incredibly important. I know some fantastic space artists. I myself got into space kind of along the lines of doing video editing and sort of an artistic side. And that's, and that's what I did and then got into telescope operations. So I'm a perfect example of having a, a varied background and being able to apply that in the space industry. So um, really anything that you think of, uh, I was talking to a chef the other day who's obsessed with space and he's like, I'd love to be able to develop food that tastes better. And so, there's so many space law, there's space lawyers. That's going to be incredibly important. We're talking about mining asteroids and, or the possibility of countries trying to mine the moon and the implications that could have in terms of altering the gravity of the moon and things. Uh, space law is going to be incredibly important. So there is a wealth of opportunity within the space industry for a different sort of career option. So I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, and can I just say, Danielle, yeah, right, just if um, whatever age you're at, but it, especially if you're starting off, do something you love. The space industry is big enough for us all and, and some. So you will find a space. It's a great time to be to be interested in in doing something. And if your if your interest is in helping, or if your interest is in running your own business and becoming uh, and making sure that you you know that 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 you're very entrepreneurial and commercially minded, or if your interest is in protecting the planet so it has less of a commercialization, so it really doesn't matter. Going to Vicky back to Vicky's question, by the way, I think one of the things about Industry 4.0 and, and Space 4.0 is you know. Boo hoo us if we if we use this the wrong way. Space 4.0 really brings technologies and opportunities to us. I hope we're maturing enough as a as a small planet to realize how how best we deal with that. That's probably slightly idealistic, but that's I think the way we need to we need to take it. There are certain laws that the universe go by. As humans, we're going to learn those. Then the question is, do we use them for good 
or ill. Clearly, we've done both in the past and clearly we can do both in the future. So I think it's up to us to influence more towards the good than the bad. And that's going to be a bad that will go on for some time. But I'd like to think Al said it can be it can be for good. And actually, there was a follow on from Kaylee. I just I saw, by the way, about many opportunities for environmental engineers. Well, well, taking from what Danielle just said, um, it could be, you know, even from the point of view of the data we get back, as Al pointed out from satellites, that really helps environmental engineers to, to influence the way we um, we more sensitively and more appropriately deal with the planet here by making it fit for sustainable human um, uh, uh, living. So uh, the environmental engineers can benefit significantly from it and therefore be directly involved in it. And then going to the moon or Mars, at some point we're going to need really interesting, we're going to meet really interesting environmental engineering challenges as well, because we won't want to litter the moon and we won't want to, you know, uh, misuse it. Uh, again, probably could go on for something, but absolutely, environmental engineering, really important. Absolutely, but but that also kind of reiterates um, what Jakob was saying about the whole artificial intelligence and the importance of, uh, of, of having such skill sets um because we're, we're when it comes to uh not just space 4.0 but even industries 4.0 we're gathering so much data analyzing it and having the appropriate programming systems and analysts that can actually look at it is is becoming increasingly important um so being able to uh, develop uh, an artificial intelligence system in in collaboration with uh, the scientific knowledge that allows you to do that it, it actually is becoming more important um, both from a space area but also from a ground level system so uh, it, it it's very important and and obviously at at, at bco we, we we do what we do um um, at, 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 at MTU there are a number of different um, programs that will facilitate that um, in terms of going into the physical sciences and, and, and the number of departments that are in there um, so but it, it is becoming increasingly important um, in computer science and so on but it, it, beco it, is, it is actually extremely important to be able to marriage the, the the different skill sets um, and I, I, I go back to a comment which I've made recently about the ability to have transferable skills um, so being able just 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 because one is an expert in one area doesn't mean you can't be competent or an expert in another area you of course you can the transferable skills are very important absolutely very important. You can take an, uh, an, uh, an expertise in one area like we have done at BCO where we have analyzed images. Uh, typically, they're stellar, they're, they're super massive black holes and uh, ex extrasolar planets and so on. And we, we, we've taken that expertise and we've applied it to masks and how masks in relation to COVID-19 can be analyzed. So you, you, you have that whole uh, capacity to be able to uh, transfer your skill set, but it all starts with actually, you know, having the skill set underneath in the first instance. So, um, but a, 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 a very good question by, um, by, by Jacob and, and, and Alice in the first instance. Um, it's so, a great question, by by the way, by Julie, who's eight years old. I saw, I love it. That one. Pardon? Um, about what is the temperature on Mars. So first of all, Julie, it's great to have you here at eight years old. And it's brilliant that you, you, you have an interest in this. And you've got such a great future. I would love to be eight years old. There's so many exciting things. Mm -hmm. So it's a great question and a great age to be. So... Congratulations on being eight years old and congratulations on a great question. 
So uh, I just thought, in case it's your bedtime. So then the temperature on Mars, it varies a little bit. So during the summer, it can be, it can be a few degrees above zero. So like a, a cold day, actually warm enough for water to flow. And most of the time it's about minus 50 or thereabouts. So that's like Antarctica, a little bit colder than Antarctica. Um, so it can be really quite cold. Um, uh, and, but then it can get quite, quite balmy. Um, so you could, you could survive in, on Mars with a good jacket and, uh, and well, you need some oxygen because there's not enough oxygen on Mars uh, for us to breathe. But you'd be able to survive the cold with a good, good jacket and a good pair of boots. So if we go to Mars, um, the, uh, we, 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 we can make sure that we have the appropriate, uh, the appropriate footwear, the appropriate hat and gloves with us. And we, we actually will be able to survive. And, you know, you might be one of those people going to Mars, Julia, at eight years old. Uh, it's yeah, a possibility. Okay. You might see that. I'll mention 2050. That might seem like a very long way away to you. But you'll be young then and we'll be going to Mars most likely. So, um sends a postcard if you do get there. Uh, but a brilliant question. Thank you so much, Julia. Yeah, thanks, Julia. So anyway, uh, uh, one of you guys, that there's two questions to go that we have. So from Grania, do you think climate change will accelerate interest in Mars missions and would relocation be only for the super rich? That's, yeah, that's a big question <laughs> to me. That's a very big question. I, and nice I, hear work, this, I hear that a lot. You know, I hear um, people, the biggest concern being, uh, that everything in space is going to be for rich people. We're kind of seeing that now with like billionaires going, oh yeah, I'm going to just go out for a little space tourism and come back and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I, unfortunately, a lot of things in life usually become accessible first to the super rich, but hopefully with the people um, who are confident that the people that are interested in space exploration and the space agencies that are, are working on this sort of thing don't have the ultra rich in mind that they do have the rest of us in mind. So hopefully it won't solely be for the the uh, the ultra rich and it will be for the benefit of us and and the benefit of the human species if I can get a little philosophical there. <laughs> philosophical. Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting the, like so the, for me there are two elements to this there uh, it, there's obviously the the long-term element where we you know we do ultimately need to um we do need to as a species we do need to get off the planet um it is going to cease to exist at some point so if we want to continue no, maybe we do have a bit of time um but it is going to happen um in the shorter term i agree danielle that it, it is probably going to um, be for th those who are, are, have a bit more money initially. But if you, if you think back to the initial stages of um, even just flight uh, travel, uh, airplanes, you know, that, that was also for the rich and famous uh, at that time, you know. So, it, and, and, and then it comes on, so it, it, it's just a matter of process. It might take a bit of time. It will take a bit of time. But it, it in my opinion, I think it will actually happen. Um, it might take a small bit of longer time, but um, but that's just the nature of entrepreneurship, uh, so to speak. Um, so for anyone out there, you want to be an entrepreneur in the space industry, now is the time to get involved. <laughs> because absolutely you could definitely there, there was a second part to that question about will about the uh uh will it um about the uh, issue to do a climate and so on. So mm -hmm. I hope that us going to Mars uh doesn't make us think that we can ignore climate change here or assume mm -hmm. that we will relocate. Yep. Um, that simply isn't uh isn't a tenable what if we were in the near future yeah. for argument's sake populate mars it will be done by people being born there it won't be by people being bussed there you're not going to bus seven billion people to another planet it's not going to happen so those of us who are here for the most part are going to live out our lives here that's going to be true of future generations so we really can't uh, and it makes absolutely no sense 
to do, to 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 destroy the climate of this planet. The other the, mm -hmm. quick things on that: Mars used to be a bit like the Earth is at the moment. It used to have running water and so on, for other reasons, not to do with human intervention. Mars lost its atmosphere. There's two reasons why. It has no magnetic field, as we mentioned earlier, and it has a smaller gravity. If you have no magnetic field, then charged particles, which are normally kept in the vicinity of the planet by the magnetic field, can simply wander off into space. And if you have lower gravity, the gravity that normally keeps the atmosphere, I mean, we don't think of the, gra of the atmosphere as being kept here by gravity, but it is. Otherwise, it would be gone into space. So that's why the moon doesn't have any atmosphere. One of the reasons is that its gravity is simply too low and it has no magnetic field, so it bleeds off into space. But the problem with Mars is that four billion years ago or three billion years ago, it had an atmosphere that was new. That atmosphere allowed the planet to warm up, so we know there was liquid water. But over time, the lack of a magnetic field and the lack of gravity allow that, that atmosphere to bleed. If you don't have an atmosphere, you have no way of moderating temperatures on the planet. So you end up with one side being very hot if you're close to the sun and one side being very cold. If you're like Mars and you're reasonably far from the sun, you're just cold and colder. So it's really not a good place to be. So we need to be very clear that even by the way, top of going back to Mars, we've heard of things about, oh, we'll just terraform Mars. We'll make it live again. So to do that, we need to give it more gravity and we need to give it a magnetic field. Now, that may be possible in the future, but right now we have no way of knowing how you would actually do that on a planetary scale. So while you could reintroduce an atmosphere to Mars, it'll just bleed off back out into space. This planet, by contrast, is beautifully balanced mm. and we really can't ignore that. And, and I think we kind of know that, but one of the things that astronomy teaches us is the beauty of the balance, the, the forces of balance that this planet gives us. So almost certainly not the only one in the universe. In fact, we know from a size wise that it's almost certainly not the only one in the universe to do that. But it is beautifully balanced. Mars isn't. Mars will never be beautifully balanced. Neither will the moon or something else. So we're going to have to, as Al said, go there at some point, uh, uh, but just... We're not going to be bust there. We're going to we're going to we're going to figure out how to to start there, and that's a whole different kettle of fish. So I hope it doesn't mean that people here will say, "Let's give up Earth because we're going to Mars," because that's a really, really, really bad decision to make. You can make decisions. That's a really bad one to make. We have one last question, guys. I guess we should probably get to it. Um, uh, and it's for both of you. Uh, what do you think about the Starship rocket? And will you be watching the SN11 live, so the, the, the launch? Yeah, well, I, um, I think it's it's been postponed till tomorrow, I believe. Um, it was supposed to launch this evening. Um, but I, I think it's been postponed till Tuesday. But yes, absolutely, we will, we will definitely be watching it live because that, it's a fantastic program so uh yeah we will definitely be watching it so uh you know the 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 whole starship endeavor has been fantastic in uh technological development um and you you'll actually i i think we i think we'll over time kind of like um Kind of like or like or other endeavors like you know Formula One and Moto GP and so on and like that. I think we'll we'll see a kickback in in some of the te technology that they've developed, um, and I, I think we'll see that coming into everyday life um, over over time. So absolutely, I will personally I will be. Uh, Danielle, uh, are are you going to be watching the SN level? This is the easiest question I've had all night. Yes, absolutely. I have been watching them all. Well, not every single one, but I've watched the last two and I'm obsessed with these missions. I think it's, it's so fascinating to watch these rockets launch and whether they land or not, uh, both sides of that coin is incredible because we're learning things from the landing that's successful and the explosions. So I hear people go, well, they're just wasting so much money and they're just destroying these rocks. There's so much being learned from these 
these failures. And I think for me, the beauty of watching uh, SpaceX grow and being able to develop these sorts of things is that they are allowed to do that. They're allowed to fail. And be, be from that failure, they're learning so much. And it's such a different, um, it's a different way of doing development compared to space agencies because they have to be, space agencies are tax funded. And so they have to really prove where their money is going and how it's being used. And taxpayers don't want to see their money exploding on launch pad pads. That's just, <laughs> that's just it. So when you have private industry doing it and you have somebody who's got loads of money and he said, he's just like, let's do it. Even if they say, well, there's something wrong and it might not work and we're not quite sure. He just says, I don't care if it's, if today's the day, let's launch and see what happens. I think it's such an interesting experiment live to watch. So I, yeah, my short answer is hundred percent. I, I absolutely will be watching that launch. Absolutely. And uh, even if I'm at work and I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, <clears throat> I'm sure Niall will 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 be, will be the same. But it, it's an interesting person, and and then we'll we'll get on to the final query. Um, but you know the whole public private partnership, that dynamic that has changed within the space industry has been very interesting in the last number of years. Um, you know. And it's not just it's it's not just uh, you know, Americanized. You know, it's, it's coming from South Africa. It's coming from Australia. It's coming from India. It's coming from China. It's coming from all across the globe. To be honest, um, but there is that public-private partnership, and then back into Europe, where we have this whole public-private partnership going on as well. There is there is that massive shift towards making sure that we optimize and maximize the impact by combining the public sector knowledge and public sector in, in finances to some degree with the private sector system um, because it's it's just such a, a good relationship and it, it, for me I, that's one of definitely one of the the ways I see it going forward into the future um, and you know, so what What do you want to get into the public or private sector? I don't think it matters. You can still be involved in space. Uh, we do have um, one more information system. Um, Danielle, do you, do you want to give a quick shout out about the competition? Yeah, so I just want to remind everyone that we do have a photo competition running and it, it, your target for the night sky is the moon. So get out there with whatever you got that you can take a photograph with and uh, you can submit your photographs to the succeeding together at mtu.ie email and make sure you get those images in before the 30th of April. We're very much looking forward to seeing those. So clear skies, everyone. I hope you have very clear Which skies. Which is my birthday, by the way. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and just by the way Mary Goggin had asked whether it does have to be current and yes we would like it to be a new photograph of the moon that's taken during this next yeah. uh, time period and just to remind people that there's a super moon on the 27th uh, and uh, look I'm going to say it uh, we're, we're to the end I'm not a big I don't jump up and down with the super moon the moon comes closer and farther from, from the, the earth Every 28, every 27 and a quarter days, sometimes it happens to be full when it does that, sometimes it isn't. It's, it's, I love the moon, whether it's big, bad, or indifferent, uh, a bit like Danielle said earlier on. But nevertheless, it's good, often a good way, a good thing just to go out and have a look at the moon. It'll look a little bit bigger, a little bit brighter. And I think that's fascinating. Um, I, I think just, I wanted to say two things I think we're, we're probably coming to, 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 to close the session. First of all, thanks to everyone who joined us. And, and, and most of you stayed on and we really appreciate that. And we hope that you enjoyed it. And we didn't get to talk about half of the things we were going to talk about, by the way. So that's good. Thank you so much for the questions. Brilliant. That's exactly what we wanted. We love that. And we'd love to continue to, to chat through them. I hope it comes across that we have some thoughts, but they're thoughts and ideas. And your role in this is helping to formulate the next generation of thoughts and ideas. So that's the first thing. Thanks to everybody for, for, for doing that. Thanks to... The marketing department, MTU, to Philip and Mervyn for putting in a lot of work about the whole series, not just about tonight. And um, Michael Loftus, the vice president for external affairs, um, who is really leading out on, on all of this, making sure that people understand that Munster Technological University really is something new and 
um, something with a, a determination and an aspiration to have impact. Uh, and that includes domains which previously we may have considered are ones that we should look at instead of be involved in. If you go away thinking, I'm going to look at space and not be involved in it, we've missed something, be involved. And the third point is on that, unlike previously, countries like Ireland or people working in industry and education in countries like Ireland would probably have imagined that they would report on. We're now in the era, era of making those reports for other others to talk about. So be involved. The, the requirements are so much less to get involved in space industry and astronomy than they used to be. Technology has democratized space in a massive way. It's up to us to take good advantage of that. But we have less reason to say, you know what, it was too big for me, it was too expensive. That's no longer the case. And uh, over the next number of years, BCO, MTU, BCO, we certainly hope to continue to work with government departments and other agencies to make sure that the regulatory and policy frameworks are put in place to help uh, Irish business, education and uh, public take maximum advantage from Space 4.0. That's something that we take very seriously and are very excited about. So thank you all. Uh, great fun from our side. We enjoyed, if you enjoyed it a tenth as much as I did, you had a, you had a pleasant evening. So uh, we'll say good night and uh, look forward to some future sessions related to this. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.